All right, I uh, got the signal that we can start. So um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ellen McKenzie, Dean of the School of Public Health, and just thrilled to be here. Um, and thank you all for joining us uh, for the inaugural Clag Mione uh, Lectureship. Um, did I hear a faint clap? I don't, I don't, there you go. Definitely, uh, what's that? <laughs> Some guy, you know. <laughs> We're going to focus on the Mione half of it. <laughs> um, uh, but um, uh, it, it's great to be here, and it's great to be in person, but I want to also welcome everybody who's able to join us um, online. And we are so fortunate to welcome a leading expert in health inequities, David Dawes, who will be the inaugural, our first uh, lecture in this prestigious uh, series of lectures. Um, Dr. Pollock, um, uh, Porter, I still can't get used to uh, <laughs> not saying Dr. Pollock. <laughs> Dr. Pollock Porter um, will be introducing our keynote speaker in just a few minutes, but I would like to take this opportunity, first of all, to say a few words about our honorees, uh, Mike Clegg and Lucy uh, Mione. Now, um, those of you who are uh, looking out uh, at many of you, and you may be asking, well, they don't need any introduction. What are you talking about? Um, but um, uh, for, uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Mike and Lucy, I'd just like to say a few words um, for them. And, and they are truly, um, those of you who have known Mike and Lucy for many years, um, know what a truly, truly wonderful couple um, they, uh, they are and the impact that they've had um, on our school. So Mike, let, I will start with that guy, Mike uh, Clagg, uh, who preceded me as dean, uh, serving the school for 12 years um, as dean from 2005 to 2017, leading the way to transformative changes in the school. He helped us tackle incredible technological shifts in learning. He raised our profile as a thought leader and policy innovator, and he oversaw tremendous growth in our faculty and helped us to develop stronger partners with both the university, but very importantly with public health schools around the world. I was very fortunate um, to benefit from Mike's leadership when I was chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management. Um, and to this day, I, seek, I still seek uh, Mike out for uh, advice about all sorts of issues um, that cross the desk of the dean, many of which you know, he never told me about when I sought his counsel about becoming dean. Uh, he just told me the good parts. He didn't tell. Uh, <laughs> they're all good parts, actually. Um, he... I remember, Mike, you said it's the best job in the world, and I have said that over and over again. Um, it's truly an honor um, and a privilege to serve as dean. Um, um, you know, what I've always admired about Mike uh, is his commitment to the school, to public health, but most importantly to people and people of the school. For Mike, it's always about people. And um, that's what I, uh, when I think about Mike, uh, he, it's amazing. He walks the halls of the school. I bet you that's true even today. Um, and he knows everybody. And he knows everybody's name. It's just amazing. Um, but he really, that's, um, it's all about people for Mike. And of course, Mike accomplished quite a lot before he was dean um, and during his deanship. Um, but as a physician, he treated many low-income patients in East Baltimore and studied racial disparities in kidney disease. So it feels very fitting that today's lecturer will be talking about uh, health disparities um, and this inaugural lecture in the Clagg and <clears throat> Mione lecture series. Um, so let's turn to Lucy. So uh, Lucy has also had quite a long history here at the Bloomberg School. She is a proud alumna. Uh, having earned her SCM in biostatistics. She then joined the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine faculty for many, many years before changing from a joint appointment to a primary appointment here at the school in 2006. She's been involved in some exceptional work in that time, including helping to lead the precursor study, which for those of you who may not be familiar with the precursor studies, really began as a curious experiment and became a piece of groundbreaking longitudinal research. It involved students from the School of Medicine who 
basically volunteered to help keep a running medical chart throughout their lives. And this effort has provided a, a wealth of data that's led to uh, many important discoveries uh, thanks to the hard work of researchers like Lucy and others. And Mike actually worked on this study as well, and the two of them have published many, many uh, articles and conference papers together. And what's more, when Mike became dean, um, uh, Lucy was an important, a tremendous partner uh, to, to Mike, and uh, together they were the best advocates for the school, um, helping to build stronger relationships with our supporters. It's also worth noting that today's lectureship was established through the efforts of the, first of all, with the school's department chairs. So they came together and they said, okay, we, everybody loved Mike, right? When he was, um, when he was Dean, um, and especially the department chairs, we had a very special relationship with him. So we wanted to do something to honor him. And so we decided we would um, fund a lecture series uh, in his honor. They, want, they came together, the chairs came together because they wanted to create something very special to honor Mike and Lucy. Um, and their planning and generosity made this event possible. But then other faculty, staff, and friends uh, gave to the lectureship as well. And the extent of the collective commitment um, for this lectureship, I think, tells a lot about how important and how beloved Mikey, Mike, Mikey. <laughs> 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 How beloved Mike, Michael, <laughs> and Lucy are uh, to the, um, uh, especially to the Bloomberg School community. I hope you both are so very proud to see this amazing uh, event come together. It took a while. Um, uh, we had this pandemic that kind of um, uh, got in the way, but we finally pulled it together, and this is our inaugural lectureship. Um, and it's a, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a continuation of the impact um, that you um, have had on the school and a testament to how much, again, that you mean uh, to our community. So Mike and Lucy, um, thank you so very much. We're so grateful to all you've done and all you continue to do uh, for the school and for public health. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Keisha Pollock Porter, um, who will introduce our keynote speaker for today. Great. Thank you so much, Ellen. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for responding. <laughs> I so appreciate the opportunity to be here to introduce Daniel Dawes. And I want to thank Mike and Lucy because when when I was um, voluntold that HPM would be the first host of this, this series, I reached out to them and said, do you have any thoughts on, on who you'd like to hear from? And they said, you know, whoever you think. And I'm thrilled to be able to reach out to a friend and a colleague and invite him to be here today to give this lecture. So Daniel Dawes is a widely respected healthcare and public health leader, health policy expert, educator, and researcher who serves as the senior vice president of global health equity and the executive director of the Institute for Global Health Equity at Meharry Medical College. Prior to this, Daniel was the executive director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute and a professor of health, law, policy, and management at Morehouse School of Medicine. He is the author of two groundbreaking health policy books, of which I hope you have both, 150 Years of Obamacare and the Political Determinants of Health both published by the Johns Hopkins University Press, and the press is here today, which is great. Among his many achievements, and there's too many to list, I'll just highlight a few. Professor Dawes was an instrumental figure in developing and negotiating tremendous federal policy, including the Mental Health Parity Act, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the Affordable Cares Act health equity focused provisions, among many, many others. He was also principal investigation excuse me, principal investigator for the nation's first health equity tracker, co-founder of the Health Equity Leadership and Exchange Network, or HELEN, and PI of the HHS National COVID-19 Resiliency Network. Professor Dawes is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and an elected fellow of the New York Academy of Medicine. He serves in many advisory roles, including on the White House COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force and an appointed member of the CDC's Advisory Committee to the Director where he co-chairs the CDC's health equity work. 
I'm just thrilled that he's here today. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Dawes, the 2020 speaker for the inaugural Mike and Lisa. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right. Wonderful. First of all, let me thank you so much, Dr. Pollock Porter, for that very kind introduction. And of course, I am honored, excited to join you all today. You know, when I got the invitation and I was learning about the brilliant work of, of, of course, Dean um, Clagg and, um, of course, Dr. Mione, uh, Professor Mione, I was impressed how much they had done to really push the developmental disability discipline further. And so thank you both for that. That is an area that I feel very passionate about under the umbrella of health equity. And of course, thank you for pushing health disparities as a discipline in public health. We know that it's often been relegated uh, on the hierarchy of value that we place on research on the low end of the totem pole. And so it's really exciting to see how much you all influenced that, uh, that important discipline. So. Um, with that said, I do want to just acknowledge a few other folks. Um, I know Barbara Pope is in the audience, and I do want to acknowledge her and the Johns Hopkins University Press that took a chance on this, um, you know, young and budding scholar when my first book came out, and no one else um, would take a look at 150 years of Obamacare was too contentious, right? The title alone. But um, Johns Hopkins University Press said this is worthy of our imprint. It is worthy of, um, and it expands the boundaries of our knowledge on, on health reform from an equity lens. So I do appreciate that. And of course, as we talk about the social determinants of health, you know, I've been challenging even that notion to an extent, talking about what are the fundamental causes and the instigators of the social and the structural conditions in which we all are born into, we live in, and we play. And so um, again, excited to have this opportunity to present this year's um, lecture. So, you know, as I was preparing for this lecture, I was think, thinking to myself, how fitting that we're having this lecture, you know, during National Mental Health Month as we are commemorating the 20th anniversary of the Institute of Medicine's Unequal Treatment Report, a landmark uh, report, as we know, that really opened our eyes to inequities in the healthcare system. And even as we think about um, the 60th anniversary of President Kennedy's uh, landmark law, actually the last one he ever signed into law, the Community Mental Health Act, uh, which was groundbreaking for those of us who are mental and behavioral health champions. So uh, very, very exciting time to be hosting this. I also was thinking too, what an interesting time that we're living in. So when you think about it, any Ken Burns fans in the audience? Yes? Okay, good. So you should, you should uh, be very well aware that Ken Burns um, has basically concluded that today we are wrestling with the fourth great crisis in our nation's history. And he says that this crisis has been fueled by a once in a 100 year pandemic, a 404 year old syndemic perpetuated by racism. And of course, an age old epidemic of misinformation, paranoia and conspiracies. So I want us to think about that as we're moving in. You know, just let these statistics wash over you for a moment. I know many of you have seen these stats and many others in one form or another. Um, highlighted in over 7,000 peer-reviewed journal articles to date. You know, these under-resourced groups have really struggled to live in a society that has intentionally erected barrier after barrier, intended to weaken their bodies and hasten their deaths, leading to the striking inequities in health status, in healthcare, and in life expectancy that we see across the board. You know, the situation is getting dire. Interestingly enough, Prior to COVID-19 hitting us, The Lancet in 2019 had um, published a groundbreaking study showing that the United States' life expectancy rankings were expected to decline from 43rd to what? 64th in the world in the next 20 years. So COVID now, interestingly, has been exacerbating things a little bit. We now find ourselves at 46. What I found very interesting is that when you think about it from an equity lens, right? you think about the groups that are harmed because of the isms and whatnot in our society, you can see the impact it is having. What I also find interesting is that as we are becoming a more racially pluralistic society, as we can see this country continue to, more, to be diverse more racially and otherwise, 
It's expected that the economic burden of health inequities is projected to be significant as well, right? From $300 billion in 2009, and let me give a shout out to Dr. Gaskin and team at the Disparities um, Solutions Center here at um, the Bloomberg School. Interestingly enough, this was the study back in 2009 as we were negotiating the Affordable Care Act, and we needed to remain at the table with the policy negotiations, pushing our health equity agenda. When we were making the, or, the moral argument that 83,000 African Americans alone are dying prematurely each year, that was enough, but for so long in the negotiations. Folks then said, well, it's sad, Daniel, but we need to understand if you are pushing this health equity agenda in the Affordable Care Act and health reform negotiations, you have to be able to demonstrate the cost reduction that these provisions will lead to. And we were scratching our heads back in the summer or in May, I think it was, May, June of 2009, trying to figure out how in the world are we gonna get this study done? I get this call from Brian Smedley, who had led the Institute of Medicine's Unequal Treatment Report, saying, Daniel, actually, there are a group of researchers at Johns Hopkins University at the Bloomberg School who are working on the economic costs of health inequalities in America. And we said, oh my goodness, that's great. This is fantastic. We got that report, we got a glimpse of it, and we decided to hold a Senate briefing. And so we had Ted Kennedy, we had Senator Hatch and others come in, and we did this joint um, briefing to highlight the cost burden at that time, which was $300 billion. And this is looking at a host of chronic diseases, as much data as they could get their hands on, a very conservative number. Notice now in, 30, in, in 2022, that number with just the top five costliest diseases has risen to $320 billion. Isn't that fasc fascinating, right? And... If you think about it, in the next 17 years, they project that this will cost us $1 trillion just from those five chronic diseases. So from asthma, diabetes, prostate cancer, breast cancer, um, heart disease, et cetera. So something to think about as we're moving forward. Now, I know many of us you know, have seen the recent headlines highlighting the everyday impact of the political determinants of health. We have seen over the last three years the struggle to advance health equity in America and the levers of politics and policy that have been used at all levels and by all branches of government to either hinder or advance this notion of health equity. So this begs the question, what gives rise to the determinants and drivers of these health inequities? And why have they been disproportionately affecting so many different population groups, minoritized and marginalized, for so long? Well, we all know that racial and ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, lower socioeconomic status individuals, LGBTQ plus individuals, and folks living in rural communities die disproportionately each year. And of course, the toll that it takes is unconscionable. But the one thing that we should never forget is that the nation's health is not an organic outcome. It is absolutely not a coincidence, right, that these things have been happening, that we see certain groups of Americans and others experiencing higher premature death rates or poor health outcomes than others. But why? Why have they been happening? Well, today we recognize that there are a variety of forces that determine our health and the quality and the extent of our lives on this earth. And uh, we know them to include the social determinants, the behavioral health determinants, healthcare, economics, genetics, et cetera. And key among the determinants, it is argued, are the social determinants of health, right? That create the structural conditions in which we find ourselves in, which we live in, we play in, we worship and we die in, et cetera, that affect all aspects of our health. And of course, you know, they play an outsized role in these human made pre-existing inequities. But underlying each one of these social determinants, environmental determinants, et cetera, are political determinants that we can no longer ignore. You see, for too long, we've been stopping at the social drivers of inequities, failing to look back and to dig deeper to see the depths of the problem and to understand its root, root causes and distribution. And as a result, we've been missing the link between these multiple determinants of health and their underlying policy and political roots. You see, for every social determinant of health, there was a preceding law, legislation, regulation, ordinance, et cetera, that resulted in the structural conditions in which we find ourselves in. So I wanted to ex expand upon this concept, right, with a short story. 
And I want us to all think, so this is a school of public health. We're going to take a, do a healthy activity. And I want you to put on your creative hats for a minute. Think with me for a moment. If you were to envision all of society sitting on the banks of a mighty river, fishing and finding nourishment in the resources that the river provides, the health inequities that we face are represented by the differences in the caliber and the quantity of fish we encounter. Some people have a bounty of healthy fish and vegetation to feed off of, while others may only have small fish, no vegetation, or malnourished fish. You see, different people having access to different types of resources and different parts of the river represents the social determinants of health. Now, some people are located in a slower moving part of the river by no fault of their own, while others are located in more lush parts of the river and benefit because of such by specific decisions that were made on their behalf. These are the political determinants of health. Somewhere upstream, decisions were made to divert the river to benefit certain people and harm others, while decisions were made to place certain types of people on specific banks of the river while placing others elsewhere. These upstream decisions absolutely have downstream impacts. And I think this pandemic over the last three years demonstrates the inconvenient and the harsh truth about the impact that these determinants of health have and how collectively these factors contribute to our society's health inequities. Why is that? It shows the compounding effect of these political determinants over personal responsibility. Think about that for a minute. No matter how much many African Americans, Latinx Americans, Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, Alaska Natives, um, lower socioeconomic status individuals and others try to act responsibly. There are always these structural, institutional, interpersonal, and even intrapersonal obstacles that have been hindering them. And beneath these communities notice, political determinants have pulled and continue to pull those strings, right? That prevent them from achieving their full health potential. So this begs another question, how did we get here? How did we get here to these striking inequities in health status and health care? How is it that inequality gets under our skin, leading to biological weathering or accelerated aging in our bodies, as Dr. Arlene Geronimus has coined? How is it that it results in the earlier onset of chronic diseases within certain communities, as Dr. David Williams has demonstrated? Well, we all know that the impact of slavery has been associated with contemporary mortality, with poverty, heart disease, intergenerational trauma, infant and maternal mortality, and the list goes on. And so as we think about the structural conditions, as we think about race norming and, and ethnic adjustments in cognitive assessment tools and healthcare and beyond, as we think about all these things, we really need to be thinking about how they came to be in the first place. So today I want to look quickly at big P policy and little p policy, both governmental and non-governmental policy. And I want to take us back 400 years. And although I believe that 1619 is a fair starting point, I want to start at 1641. And I start there because this was the time when the business interests, the commercial interests, wanting to sustain their business model of slavery, recognized that the abolitionists were making headway in their attempts to abolish slavery. And so what do they do? They get with the policymakers at the time. They devise this template called the Body of Liberties Law. And in that law, they first shopped it in Massachusetts. They then shopped it in the other colonies. And they worked time and time again to get it passed. Finally, they succeeded right in New York, Maryland, Connecticut, and beyond. Well, the abolitionists said, hmm. You know, we believe upon reading that law that it never intended to include the offspring of these enslaved people. So what do they do? They fought to make sure that was interpreted as such. And the commercial interests and the policymakers at that time said, you know what, we've got to amend the law now to include the offspring and ensure that these individuals would be deemed for purposes of the law, slaves, generation after generation. As if that weren't enough, as we think about the structural conditions again, Think about this, right? Immediately after that, you had policymakers working with the commercial interests to again develop laws 
that would prohibit black or indigenous population groups from being able to raise their own food. We know food is a critical social determinant of health. They were prohibited by law from being able to learn to read and write. We know education is a critical social determinant. They were prohibited by law from doing what? From being able to earn their own money. Again, employment is a critical social determinant. The list goes on, but there's another one I'll bring up quickly, and that's the idea of movement. We know movement is key to life, and yet there were jurisdictions, depending on the jurisdiction, there were laws that were established limiting movement beyond a one-mile radius for those who were Black or Indigenous. You had to have a pass if you were going to go beyond the one mile. You had to have a lantern at night. Again, acts of law prohibiting movement, prohibiting them from being able to exercise another critical determinant of health. Well, what happens after that? We saw these laws being recycled from one generation to the next, from one century into the next, from the 1600s into the 1700s, then into the 1800s, when Jim Crow reared its ugly head with a vengeance. What happens? We then see the proliferation of laws at the local, the state, federal laws, again, making it, at the federal level, making it extremely difficult for these population groups to be able to address their civil rights needs and to address their social determinants of health needs. After that, we go now post-Reconstruction, after Jim Crow era, there's another attempt by the abolitionists, by health equity champions, very much like yourselves in this audience, who said, you know what, enough is enough. Oh, government, you cannot continue to push for these explicitly racist policies, these policies that are denying one group the benefits of these social and economic policies just because of their race or ethnicity. That's unconstitutional. That's a violation of our Equal Protection Clause. But what happens? As we have seen over the last three years especially, racists are very creative people. And they use that creativity again to devise laws while they could not on their face discriminate against one group versus another. They were devised in such a way, what we call in the law, facially neutral policies, right? So that once they were implemented, they would have the same effect. So think about this. After World War I, we have Social Security Act uh, being implemented. And at that time, you had the Franklin D. Roosevelt administration saying, hmm, we've got to do some stuff to stimulate the economy after the war. Dr. Perrin, who was a Surgeon General at the time, for those of you who remember public health history, and really a mastermind be behind the syphilis study in Tuskegee and um, the, the other um, studies, syphilis studies in Guatemala, he actually was one of the main framers of Social Security, and he developed in such a way that it would actually exclude agricultural and domestic workers, which at that time, 78% of African Americans fell into that bucket, and immigrant groups as well. So he was intentionally trying to exclude them by locking out those professions. You can see then afterwards, there was another attempt at legislation, this time again to stimulate the economy and to figure out where we should be uh, putting resources. And this one is the Homeowners Loan Corporation Act. In this law, the law it basically authorized with state and local governments, um, property appraisers to go out into over 200 cities and the neighborhoods of 200 cities and to basically grade them from an A, B, C, or D scale, color code them accordingly. And in this case, the A communities were your affluent white communities, your B communities were your middle-class white communities, your C communities were your quote-unquote undesirable immigrant communities. These were your largely Mexican, Cuban, Irish, German, Jewish, Italian communities at the time. And then lastly, your D communities were your red communities. These were classified as hazardous communities, right? And these were your primarily African-American communities at that time. Well, once these reports were done in these neighborhoods, they were aggregated, sent back to the federal government, which then in turn used it to make additional policies, further restricting access to resources by those who had been redlined and to a degree yellow-lined in our country. Again, starving them of resources that they needed not only to survive, but thrive in our nation. So you can see how that's worked. Well, going back now to policy, 
big P policy and little policy, let me take you to the Truman era. We go through World War II. Now there's another emphasis on stimulating the economy. The nation was on its knees from malnutrition and from a host of other issues, public health issues. And here folks said, you know, President Truman, we got to pass comprehensive health reform. He tried, couldn't get his uh, folks in the party to align. So he, um, he didn't try again. But we do know that it's through these efforts that um, we saw the Highway Act um, develop. And for many of you who work in residential segregation, you'll, quite, um, you'll understand this uh, quite significantly had an impact. And um, this 41,000 interstate highway, mile interstate highway, actually had the effect of cutting neighborhoods in two, right? Splitting them in two. We saw the Housing Act that created the Urban Renewal Program. Again, all facially neutral, but once they were implemented, they were implemented in a discriminatory manner. They also had very significant health effects on these communities, displacing about half a million black and brown uh, population groups in the United States at that time. Again, having significant health effects. Today, we can see how those, the placements of railroad tracks by, again, acts of law and policy. We can see the location of bus depots by political decisions, right? How they have a negative health impact or a positive health impact on one group versus another. It's important that we understand that. So in this case, moving full speed ahead for the sake of time, you can see how collectively these policies have compounded one year after the next and have had direct impact on the health outcomes of people of color and lower socioeconomic status uh, groups in the country. Now, we also see from epigenetic research how this has led. You can see the intergenerational trauma over time. You can see aggressive breast cancer prevalence in African-American women, again, owing to certain periods where they're dealing with the isms in our society, the most deadly form of breast cancer in the country. You can see today how these policies, these laws, have a poverty tax, essentially, on these communities where they have to pay higher payments for auto insurance and home mortgage loans. And then we are moving forward. We can see how these have led to food, pharmacy, and hospital deserts in our communities. And interestingly enough, where Big P policy decided we're not going to invest in certain communities, you see the commercial interest saying, well, if the government isn't going to invest in these communities, why would we ever take a chance? That would be a poor return on our investment, they have argued. And is it any wonder we see these deserts, making it more difficult for these communities to access the resources to improve their health and sustain and maintain their health? Well, as we are moving forward, we are also facing another existential threat through climate change, right? Climate gentrification, again, impacting hundreds of thousands of racial and ethnic minorities across the country and lower socioeconomic status groups, where, interestingly enough, policy had been developed forbidding black and brown folks from being able to purchase property near the seashore. They were then pushed ironically um, further inland under, on higher elevated land. Now as the sea levels are rising across the country and across the world, we see again the displacement of thousands of racial and ethnic minorities and others who are being pushed out of their communities uh, to make room for more affluent communities. So. Uh, it is having serious health impacts, as we all have seen, as researchers, including yourselves, I'm sure, have been documenting. Well, all told, we can see the impact that these political determinants of health have on communities of color. Now, Professor Michael Marmot, Sir Michael Marmot uh, at UCL in London, has stated that life expectancy as a measure of health tells us a great deal about how we are doing as a society and the inequalities in health tell us even more about a society. Where you live absolutely matters. And as you can see, the neighborhoods that were largely redlined, that were starved of resources by acts of law and policy, are now today the very communities that have the lowest life expectancies and the worst health outcomes. Notice the generation that is lost, the 20 year difference in neighborhoods in a city. Well. We've been talking about how policy has been a driving force for many of the health inequities in our society, either what we've seen or we've experienced ourselves, but it can also be a driving force for achieving health equity in the communities that you work in or live in. Here's why, because I believe that only policy can fix what policy created in the first place. 
So I'm going to take us back one more time into the past. Promise one more time. My wife says I live in the past, but I promise I live in the present and I'm always thinking, you know, future. But anyway, let me take you back because I've had folks who say, Daniel, that's not fair. You started at 1641. That's not a fair starting point. We weren't even a constitutional republic then. Why would you start there? I said, all right, fine. Let me start at 1789. I'm going to start at 1789 because this was the period where you had mental health reformers. Any mental health reformers in the audience? Any champions for mental health? Just a few? I, I was expecting everyone to raise their hands, right? There is no health without mental health, as Dr. Satcher has reminded us. But, but I digress. So we go back in time, the mental health reformers, the abolitionists, and the advocates for homeless populations had gotten together and they started strategizing and they were trying to think of a way to get the federal government, our newly established government, to provide for the general welfare of all its people. And as they were strategizing, folks said, you know what, we need a major policy influencer. We need someone who's going to help push this agenda and push it effectively. And so as they thought about it, they said, you know, Benjamin Franklin, he should be our person. We need him to lend his name to this cause. And so they approached Benjamin Franklin. They had already drafted a petition. And they said, Benjamin Franklin, would you please lend your name to this? And in the petition, they called for the federal government to stop the separation of children from their mothers, to stop the breakup of enslaved families, to abolish slavery once and for all, to actually provide the necessities that vulnerable groups in our country needed, right? Food and adequate clothing and education. They also fought for health care access um, and true employment opportunities, what we now consider critical social determinants of health. Well, Benjamin Franklin says, yes, I will lend my name to this petition. Um, having been a lifelong slave owner himself, as he grew older, he recognized what an evil institution it was. And just before his death, he decided to sign on to this cause and to lend his name. Well, that he did. The petition gets to Congress. It gets to the House and the Senate. And if you think that we are having a very contentious debate over racial equity and social justice in America, it seems to me from the records that it was equally as contentious, if not more. Folks said, how dare you, Benjamin? How dare you, health equity champions, right? Push this petition and push these issues when you know that we're just getting settled as a government. Now is not the time to be handling these issues. Isn't that a refrain we've heard time and time again, still today, right? After 230 plus years. Well, the Senate said, we're not even going to dignify Benjamin Franklin's petition with a response. But the House said, we can't let him get away with this. And so in bullet by bullet form, they actually made the argument why the federal government could not provide these necessities, why they could not provide these resources to these enslaved groups, to these poor whites, to these folks who had been suffering from mental illness in our society and homelessness. And they essentially made a confederalism argument. They punted the issue. They said, you know what? It's not, it's not our role as a federal government to provide for the general welfare of these folks. The states are the ones who should be leading that because the states are closest to these people. Therefore, they know what's in the best interest of these people. Punted the issue. It would take 75 years later for the political stars to align after we were going through a major war, the Civil War, for the federal government to change its thinking, and this time under the leadership of President Abraham Lincoln. For the first time ever now, you had a federal government, a government that was pretty sensitive to this, recognizing that after the war, folks would need resources. Folks would need access to health care. They would need access to education and true employment opportunities. And so President Lincoln and his supporters worked assiduously over two years to craft a bill, the Freedmen's Bureau Act, which arguably is the most comprehensive and reticulated health policy that addressed health inequity issues at the time. Well, two years in the debate, they still couldn't get the bill passed as the war was winding down. So President Lincoln says, enough is enough. Go ahead, strike that provision that is holding it up. And that provision was a provision to provide health care services 
to newly freed people and poor whites who had been displaced as a result of the war. Interesting, huh? That was the most contentious issue, providing health care services. So in the spirit of compromise, folks said, sure, President, we will strike that, we'll get it passed, and we'll send it to your desk for your signature. They did that. And four weeks later, what happens? Anybody recall history? President Lincoln was assassinated. That's right. He was assassinated. And his supporters, not wanting to squander the opportunity the crisis presented, said, you know what? Upon rereading that statute, the Freedmen's Bureau Act, we do believe that it actually authorizes us to provide health services to these newly freed people and poor whites who've been displaced because of the war. And so they went about establishing sanitariums, hospitals, clinics around the country in the South and Midwest. They started recruiting clinicians from the North into the South and in the, in the Midwest. And they worked tire, tirelessly to provide access to these necessities of life, these social determinants of health, if you will. But what have we seen over the course of the last few years? Racism doesn't sleep in America and hate never takes a break. And that's exactly what happened. So for seven years, while that major health reform was allowed to take some root, there was an attempt to uproot it every single year. And in 1872, they finally, opponents of health equity, finally succeeded in uprooting and dismantling America's first major health reform program. It was a huge disaster that would set back um, care and access to these necessities for our most marginalized and minoritized groups in America. Think about that for a minute. So fast forward, to make a long story short, it would then take us 150 years later. As we know, we've had some piecemeal attempts, right, in health policy to address and correct some of the access issues to healthcare and whatnot um, with the social services um, and so forth. But it wasn't until President Obama where we now had a chance to group and we brought 300 diverse national organizations represented virtually every stakeholder group in America, representing racial and ethnic minorities, older adults, veterans, faith-based groups, LGBTQ groups, people with disabilities, women's groups, you name it, coming together, fighting and advocating for comprehensive health reform. Isn't that something? 150 years later. Well, before folks say to me, my gosh, Daniel, you're so depressing listening to, right? It took us 150 years to get here. Now, was it going to take us three? So first 75 years, 150, is it going to take us 300 years before we see true health equity in America? Well, here's why I think there is tremendous hope is for this. So we've seen how the hierarchy of human value evolved over time in our country, right? And how inequities were structured or concretized um, in our policies and in our processes over the last 400 years. But fortunately, here's the good news, we have also witnessed, like we have in other countries, um, the incredible impact that equity-focused or egalitarian-focused policies have on the health of all populations within a country. In our case, the Civil Rights Act is one such example, and the Voting Rights Act as well is another. And you could see the effect that they had immediately following their passage and their implementation and enforcement. So I'll bring up as one study, Dr. Krieger um, brought up a, she did a very incredible study that was published in 2006. And she examined with her colleagues the effect of the 1960s civil rights laws on infant mortality rates. And here's what she found. The concurrence of the timing, the abruptness of the rate changes following 1964, the sharp decline in death from infant conditions treatable in hospital settings, and the contrast with minimal changes among whites, the contrast with minimal changes among whites suggests the Civil Rights Act was the cause of these trends. And what she estimated, along with her colleagues, was that between 1965 and 2002, 38,600 black infant deaths were prevented because of, of the Civil Rights Act, Title VI in particular. Isn't that amazing? 
to know the effect that policies can have over time. Immediately following the passage of the Voting Rights Act of Medicare and Medicaid legislation, the Fair Housing Act, we also saw declines in premature deaths of racial and ethnic minorities in the U.S. across the board, which is interesting. But then we also saw an increase in premature deaths among these groups starting in the 1980s and a widening of the life expectancy gaps between population groups after there was attempts to limit implementation of these egalitarian or equity-focused policies. You know, in our country, the principal roots of current and historical health inequities are found in the political determinants of health, which inequitably distribute social, medical, and other determinants, and they create the structural barriers to equity for population groups who lack power and privilege. All political determinants affect every one of us because they encompass the systematic process of structuring relationships, distributing resources, and administering power. However, there are stark differences in how negatively or positively they affect certain individuals and communities. So, for example, when a transportation policy removes a bus route that runs through a community with residents who heavily rely upon affordable public transportation to get them to their healthcare appointments, to get them to school, to get them to their jobs, et cetera. The individuals and families living in that community suffer from a negative political determinant that creates an inequitable resource distribution of public transportation services. Now, I know many of us have seen very forward thinking um, healthcare organizations launching programs to pay for taxis or ride shares for their patients to get to their appointments. And while those efforts are laudable, right, and effective in their immediacy, they only treat the symptom, not the root cause of the problem. Think about that, right? When such an affected community comes together to advocate for themselves, when they gather momentum by convincing more individuals and more anchor institutions, local businesses and others in their community to join their effort. When they succeed in getting their route reinstated and have enhanced opportunities to actually access and utilize it, they have understood the chance to restructure their relationship with the transportation authority and ensure more equitable distribution of resources by this government entity. They will have exercised the power inherent in understanding and in addressing the political determinants of health inequities. So let's look at how we can leverage the political determinants of health. You know, whenever I'm analyzing a health outcome, whether it's an inequity or not, I think about them in terms of how they came to be in the first place. What was the policy that created or has been perpetuating or exacerbating that result over time? How did the policy or political action or inaction structure relationships in the community? How have health protective and health sustaining resources been distributed in the community? And how has power been administered and shared, distributed in the community? Once that analysis is done, I then create an action plan based on the political determinants of health framework. So let me quickly share that with you. So once a perceived health inequity is identified, the idea here is that you must conduct your due diligence to ascertain whether the health outcome is systemic. Is it avoidable? Is it unjust? How far can you venture to understand whether it is an institutional or structural barrier that created or has been perpetuating that inequity? What is the policy change desired? And can you demonstrate the value of investing in change? So let's look at the U.S. since we're in the United States in particular. Advocates have to understand, leaders, scholars of equity have to understand the disquieting and harsh truth that the political determinants of health inequities have rarely been addressed unless their reduction or elimination served other purposes. You see, the success of any advocacy effort has depended on how palatable they are to commercial interests and whether you can demonstrate an investment value to the government. Hmm. 
Let me use this as an example, just to make sure we understand this point. No health equity focused policy has ever passed at the federal level in America unless you can tie it right to those two pieces, the commercial interests and demonstrating government investment value. Why should the government invest resources into tackling this issue? For my mental health champions, I thought I would use this as an example to hone in on the point. And, and back in 1856, as you might recall from the one of the slides, Dorothea Dix had been a school teacher, had gone and advocated, dedicated 40 years of her life um, to advocate for people with mental illness. She went around the country documenting the, the violence against people with mental illness. She showcased and wrote re uh, report after report in each of the jurisdictions to highlight how horribly people were treated. And um, at that time, many of you might recall, if you had a mental illness, oftentimes you were pushed out of your homes, you were left to fend for yourself, like what we see going on to an extent today. But at that time, people were locked up, they were chained to the walls of the prison, they were stripped naked, they were beaten, they were horribly treated. And Dorothea Dick said, enough is enough. We have got to fight and get the federal government to protect these folks. So that she did. Finally, after four decades, she gets the U.S. Congress to pass a bill called the Bill for the Indigent Insane. And this would have been the first comprehensive major mental health reform law in U.S. history. And they thought for sure we had a federal government, a president who was sensitive to mental illness, having witnessed the tragic death of his only child at the time, a son, who his wife, himself, they were on a train, they had just left a funeral, they were heading home. The train, which was a new invention, crashes in a ditch. And the only person to have died was their son. His skull split open, there were fragments everywhere. It was a horrific, based on the records, a horrific scene. Poor Mrs. Pierce never recovered from that. The records show that she became um, severely depressed, had suffered from clinical depression and anxiety for the rest of her life. Um, her husband, our future president, who was going to be inaugurated three months later, became a substance misuser um, from the records, an alcoholic. And unfortunately, instead of recognizing how important this policy would have been, what a game changer it would have been in mental health policy, he decided to veto it. He vetoed that, that uh, bill. And he basically, again, made the confederalism argument that it's, oh my gosh, well, it pains me for the federal government not to intervene and help people with mental illnesses in this country. I just don't have the constitutional authority to do that. He punted it. The mental health reformers were shocked. They couldn't believe it. They were really upset. They were depressed. What they kept doing was making the moral argument. And they kept doing that for almost 100 years until now, we went through three wars, the Civil War, World War I, World War II. And as I mentioned, after World War II, the country was on its knees, not only for malnourishment, but for mental health and so forth. 20%, there was a study that was done. The mental health advocates said, you know what? Surely there's something we can do to highlight these issues. And they did a study with the military leaders, the admirals and the generals, with even the Surgeon General at the time, and they found that 20% of young people, 17 to 24, were unfit to serve in the military. 40% of those were, were leaving the military before their time was up. And 60% of the hospital beds at that time were being occupied by people with mental illness. So the mental health reformers at that time said, you know what, enough is enough. Diseases of the brain absolutely have an impact on our systemic health. You can see that now. Right after this major war that we've gone through, you can see the effects it's having, not only from a moral standpoint, but from an economic and a national security point. And that was the argument that helped them finally get the federal government to address mental health issues in policy, because they could make the argument that, wait, these young people, if they are sicker and dying younger, how in the world can we outcompete our global competitors? How in the world do you expect us to defend the nation from external threats? Those were the arguments that were raised. They connected the dots. They showed the commercial interest and the government investment value, what it would take to push for a policy to help the least among us. It worked. We get that first piecemeal bill that actually authorized the National Institute on Mental Health. 
and we know the rest is history, right? You heard me talk about Kennedy's Community Mental Health Act, where we're deinstitutionalizing people with mental illness and allowing them, again, to live in our communities and get the care and treatments that they need from community mental health centers and so forth. The list goes on. But the mental health community finally recognized the importance of those levers to advance the cause. So I could go on and on, but for the sake of time, let me just wrap up very quickly. You know, we are really in quite an interesting time, as I mentioned, a time where we are in a crisis, as Ken Burns has stated. So where do we go from here? Well, unlike Ken Burns, I actually am pretty optimistic. I believe that today we are in the fourth period of a great awakening for health equity. The first period, as you heard me mention, was under President Lincoln's administration, where he created the policy to free newly, well, to free black enslaved folks and to ensure that poor whites and blacks would have access to resources. We saw then the backlash after that, right? Immediately after. And on the seventh anniversary, there was this period of regression, of retrenchment, of regressive devolution, quite frankly. It would then take us almost 100 years for the second awakening for health equity to occur. This time, two years into the civil rights movement, when leaders said, wait a second, you know, Dr. King is right. Of all of the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhuman. And so two years into the civil rights movement, they started strategizing and they pushed for policies that would actually elevate health um, status, improve health outcomes and so forth, desegregating the hospitals, passing Medicare, Medicaid legislation and so forth. Well, the third one occurred after that. About a decade later, when we had leaders again saying, you know what, we've been attacking and addressing and tackling the overt forms of discrimination in healthcare, but yet we still see these striking disparities in minority health. What's going on here? And so there was another attempt in the Third Awakening to address the, most, the more subtle forms of discrimination, to address disparities in health status and healthcare. That took us all the way up until the Obama administration, where we were able to work on the Affordable Care Act and incorporate 62 health equity focused provisions to address those inequities. Then we had another period of retrenchment and regressive devolution, where there was an opportunity or an attempt to undermine 45 years of bipartisan policies that were directly addressing disparities in health status among minoritized groups, poor white groups, et cetera. This takes us now into the fourth period, where we have a federal government, unlike any period in US history, that has centered health equity, has prioritized this agenda to a degree that we have never before seen, and has prioritized addressing these upstream drivers and determinants that have created these inequities that we see downstream. How will we, how will we as a collective body of leaders and scholars take advantage of this time to continue to push the cause of health equity? Well, in order to do this, I just want to leave you this final thought from my dear friend and mentor, Dr. David Satcher, who was our 16th Surgeon General, a man who dedicated his life to addressing the underrated issues in health policy, issues that many folks didn't want to tackle because they were so highly stigmatized, from minority health to sexual health to oral health and beyond. Dr. Satcher reminds me now more than ever that what we need are leaders, scholars who care enough, know enough, have the courage to do enough, and who will persevere until the job is done. First, you got to care about these communities. But caring, as you have heard during this lecture today, is simply not enough by itself. You also need to avail yourself of the knowledge of these instigators of health inequities. What you've also heard today is that this movement to advance health equity and health justice is not for the faint of heart. It takes tremendous courage to push back on those who would rather maintain the status quo. And it does take time, right? It takes a significant amount of time to change. And so we've got to persevere until we have achieved health equity. I believe there is a role for every one of us. 
I know my wife has said, Danny, oh my goodness, I can't deal with these policy issues. But I said, honey, you can deal with it at the interpersonal level. We can educate. We were having a great discussion today during lunch where we talked about Dr. King when he was talking about the two myths at the time that people were bringing up. The fact that we should wait, just wait and things will heal, it'll get better. And the other myth was the myth of public policy where folks said, Dr. King, don't you think our time would be better spent on education and religion? And he thought about it and he says, you know what? Uh, you're half correct. However, there is still a significant part to play when it comes to addressing these structural issues. So every one of us has a role, whether it's at the interpersonal, the institutional, here in your own school, your university, or the places that you work, or at the structural level in changing our policies. I wanna thank you all so very much for the privilege of your time and attention, and thank you again for the invitation to speak. Thank you so much. I um, We have a time for a few questions um, from the audience or Becky's checking online and we have some mics and just wanted to um, see if anybody has any questions for uh, Dean Clegg, you get the first one. <laughs> so, oh, we grab the mic for people online. Well, uh, that was a great talk. I mean, what a tour de force and um, you know, and as a person being who I am, I'm always struck by the history that we don't know and how the history has been told in such a bizarre way. And over the last five, 10 years in the U.S., we're finding out things that white people just didn't know, didn't know about Charleston, didn't know about Tulsa. Yeah. Um, so it's always, uh, it, was, it was a moving talk. You didn't talk about politics per se, you know, and the polarization of politics and those, those things that have been under the surface now are being said like, it's not since the KKK went away, right? And, and so I wonder if you've given thought to, we have to advocate for rational policy, right? And, and for moral policy, but, but what about um, political action? What's the path to um, decreasing polarization to have people again adopt the mores and thoughts that as a nation we once had. Oh, I love that question. So thank you for that as well. Um, as you were talking, you reminded me of uh, the time that I visited the Lincoln um, Presidential Library in Springfield, Illinois. And it was so interesting to go in and um, uh, look back in time to see what he endured politically. And a lot of what we see happening over the last few years in this country are things that were recycled from back then and probably even before then. So when I, when I think about political determinants of health, you know, I've thought about them on the front end all the way on that continuum to the back end with policy, from voting to government to the creation of the body of decision makers who will lead to this, all the way to the policy. And, and I highlight for folks, you know, what it has taken, the levers that have been used politically, right? If you are not in that uh, policymaking um, body, what can you do politically to push back and to educate and do it? And it's, it's fascinating to me how many different levers we have at our disposal to push those. So citizen-initiated ballots have a 25% success rate in advancing health policies. And yet I have rarely seen health equity champions using that at the state level, garnering the momentum behind a policy if their state legislature doesn't agree with it. We have seen attempts, and, and the other thing for me is when you think on the front end, I do think it's absolutely critical that can, folks continue to think about it in, dif in different ways. So you're not only looking at the policy outcome, but we need to be thinking about how do we push back on attempts to gerrymander, um, to restrict ballot access, right? Um, to restrict early voting efforts and whatnot. All of these things that we know were designed so that you know, folks who actually, quite frankly, need the benefits of, of these social and economic policies aren't able to participate in the democracy. I do think on the front end, politically, we need to address those. We need to leverage to the extent that we can. We have now a Supreme Court that um, we're quite interested in seeing how they're gonna rule on affirmative action. I think we all have our suspicions how that's gonna roll, but you can see how it takes time. So while immediately, a lot of my students will say, this is so unfair. You know, now we have a court that is going to be implementing policies for all of these years. You know, what can we do politically? Well, they're in there now for 
for life, essentially, right? They're 10 years for life. What are we going to do? Is it possible? Well, in this case, I do think you have to think about whether you want to stack the court. Is that the right, uh, the right approach? Or are we going to wait um, until there are openings again for us to input folks in, on the front end? So I think these are decisions folks are going to have to make at the, at the municipal level, at the state level. There are different factors that folks have, have um, leveraged, I think, to, to move the cause. And I'll say at the municipal level, because folks will say, well, Daniel, you talk so much about federal, but how do you, how do you actually implement um, and address PDOH at the local level? And I'll tell you what we did, both politically and policy-wise, was we worked with a community in Tampa, Florida, in St. Petersburg, Florida, actually. And they decided to, many of these folks had never participated in politics before. Maybe some of them voted, but a lot of them just thought, again, that politics was dirty. We're not going to associate ourselves with it. And they said, well, we believe that we can we can protect our community. We can fight for our community. And they weren't thinking about how to really move things um, from an activist and advocate standpoint. So what we did was we said, let's come together. We created this um, alliance of health equity champions, very diverse racially, as well as professionally and otherwise. And together, we met with every single person who was running for mayor. We talked about these issues. We highlighted the research that had been done um, on their community. We highlighted the cost burden to the extent that we could. And then we said, would you pledge to support this in your administration if you became the mayor or the vice mayor or whatever? And, and then from there, you could see a number of folks saying, yes, yes, I agree. And when it was said and done, you could see folks mobilizing where they went out. There were those who worked for, I believe, Johns Hopkins um, All Children's Hospital was one of those. You have some other healthcare um, entities out there that said, you know, what, we're going to register um, our patients to vote. So Vote ER was doing some stuff. Civic Health Action was also working with the medical residents, the public health students and professionals in the time. And, um, and with the community, we registered folks, we got them active, we brought them to the town halls where folks were meeting. And um, it was amazing to see them put on the spot these um, potential policymakers, right? And to get them to commit on record, when the cameras are on, to hold them accountable in the future should they win. So you could see the, the, the wheels spinning in their minds as we went through this. And then once we had done that exercise, which took, took a while, it was about probably a year and a half, then we started doing an assessment of existing policies. So, and that was actually before. So we had the, the data on the poor health outcomes by zip code, but we didn't do that connection now to what was politically or what was happening policy-wise to um, exacerbate the problems. So once we did that ass uh, assessment, we had a group of legal epidemiologists who worked with this um, group and we were able to pinpoint existing laws on the books that needed to be amended or repealed because they were doing harm to these communities. Once we did that, then they also worked, and I think it was more on parallel, working to create new laws that would have a positive benefit on them, dealing with their built environments and so forth. So that's how we tackled it in that community. We don't have data because this happened just uh, a few years ago. So we're now waiting. I'm so curious to see with all that work, with all the ordinances that have been changed, have we seen health outcomes improve? Now, granted, the pandemic sort of messed up stuff because <laughs> we had started in 2018. I'm still curious to see what effect that may have had on it. But I hope that answers your question to an extent. Perfect. Any other final questions? Yes, ma'am. If we have the data to demonstrate the economic impact of health inequities, why then do you think we have not been more successful in policy change? Do you think it's a messaging issue by advocates or do you think it's that our political system is set up to always sort of benefit racist policy the, the way that the US Constitution has set up? The yeah, that's system. another great question. So <clears throat> I would actually argue we, we don't have all the data. And I think what we've what we've been able to do is we can provide this macro level data. But when we were actually advocating for, 
you know, the Affordable Care Act, and we were pushing for these health equity provisions. At that time, actually, right before um, Daryl Gaskin's study, we actually had, there were two studies, one that was done in California, and one that was done looking at diabetes in New Mexico. Those were the only two that we had in terms of costs of inequities. And when we went to, you know, members of Congress and said, oh, by the way, you know, there's, there are these two studies showing blah, blah, blah. They're like, oh, well, that's not my district. We don't have any disparities in my jurisdiction. Then when Daryl Daryl and his team then did the study, giving us that, you know, federal, that national number, that actually, like I said, helped us stay. But there's still a lot of folks who said, well, yeah, that's, that's, the, um, that's Louisiana or Mississippi. And we even had Georgia legislators who said, that's not us. We have no disparities. And it was, it was really interesting to see that. So, so I, don't, I don't necessarily agree that we have all the data. I think we need to continue to do more research and connect the dots, right? And make the case as, 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 um, as much as we possibly can to the zip code level if possible, right? Or at least do it within their uh, jurisdictions to show, okay, in your district, this is how it looks. So we did that in Georgia. And I will tell you, even with a very conservative legislature, when we actually took the time to create our roadmap um, to action, and we created our, our, it was our blueprint to action for the state. And we showed everyone, we had done an analysis, and we showed this is the cost based on the limited data sets that we have, that diabetes is costing us, or maternal mortality is costing us, or infant mortality. Therefore, we need you to push legislation and push for resources in these communities to address it. For years, they had tried that without any luck. Finally, when we did that and we brought it down to their district, all of a sudden you could see them looking at it. And they would look, we, we developed a map of Georgia and we could show them in color code, this is yours compared to other counties. This is how you fear. This is why this is important. Don't you want to see the health status of your community elevate? Don't you want to decrease costs? So forth, so forth. And that allowed. Now, did everybody agree with us? No. There are folks who will always disagree. Those folks, you know, you try your best, and if they don't come on board, fine. But you focus on the, I think, Dr. Gaskin, you talked about the middle group, right, of folks who can be persuaded. And those were the ones that we really focused our advocacy campaign on to get to. And that worked. So I think we need to do more work to make that economic case for addressing health inequities in the United States and beyond. I hope, I hope that helps. <laughs> okay. Well, we could uh, stay here for another hour, and uh, unfortunately, we, are, we, can't, we don't have that today, but I do want to just take a moment and thank you for such an inspirational talk. Thank you for giving this inaugural lecture, and I um, want to thank you all for being here. I mean, Mike Clagg, would you like to say anything, Dean Clagg, before we wrap up this part of our time, or...? Sure. Sure. <laughs> Only, we'll good. give you the last the last word before we uh, before we move everybody to the next. <laughs> Boy, I like this podium. It's really nice. Um, that was Daniel again. That was a great talk. I just wanted to say, and Lucy and I want to say thank you uh, to everybody who made this possible. Uh, and uh, you know, when you when you somebody does something like this, it's always special. But when it's people you know and people you've worked with, it, it's even more important. So, so uh, we really look forward uh, to, to this first one and, uh, and it was worth waiting for. And just for those who don't know, the way this is set up is that, um, you know, when you, when you have little children, they always ask you, you know, which, which of the kids do you love the most? And so department chairs used to say that to me, right? And, uh, and, and we, we loved all the departments so much that this is structured that it will rotate from department to department. So, so in 10 years, we'll be back to hear, to hear a follow-up. So, so thank you very much. Thank you again, and thanks to everybody who joined us on Zoom. And for those of you in the room, we'll be heading. There's a reception upstairs in Finestone. Feel free to come join us. Um, thank you so much again for being here today. Really appreciate everyone. Um, and thank you all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.